Greetings listeners, and welcome to the All Night Society. My name is Orpheus, and I'm here to take you on a journey into the imagination. A journey that will thrill you and leave you shivering and afraid of shadows. First up, the news. The River Dogs triumphed over Columbia tonight, 4-3. to three. Councilman Brickman was exposed as a supporter of the corrupt medical professional that was found murdered last month. He has been asked to resign. More on this story as it develops. A cruise ship that left port last month was found at the bottom of the ocean near Cuba. It has been determined that there were no survivors. That's all for the news. Now the weather. He said, come wander with me, love, come wander with me, away from this sad world, come wander with me. He came from the sunset, he came from the sea, he came from my sorrow, and can love only me. Our story tonight was submitted by word of mouth. I typed it myself. The author is... I call it... The Sandman. Nothing so much as stirred in the little room I found myself in. Nothing at all. It wasn't so dark as not to be able to see anything. But it was dark enough that it took quite a while for my eyes to adjust to it. The room was small, maybe a few feet in any given direction. The one dominant feature was a drain in the middle of the sloping floor. The walls were black as midnight, and I could not distinguish if there was a door or even where the source of light by which I saw was. Pacing the floor, I found it was roughly a four foot by four foot space. Feeling the walls revealed that there was no discernible door to be found. Nothing that would let me figure out how to leave. After feeling my way around and around the walls for several minutes, I began to feel a little like hope was out of reach. I sat in the floor of the dark little room and tried to think of how I may have gotten in. Maybe that would help get me out. I had been in the park looking for my best friend Josh. He had sent me a message to meet him in the park where we used to play when we were younger. Yeah, the time we spent here as children seemed to be the key to how I wound up in this place. Something in my brain was telling me this was important. When I was a kid, about 20-ish years ago now, I had met Josh when I moved into the house next to his. My mom had taken me to the park to play. Being a boy about 10 years old, this was probably one of my favorite things to do. I had run directly to the sandbox so I could start pretending to be an archaeologist. When I arrived at the box, it was devoid of sand. Staring, bewildered and forlorn at the empty sandbox, I had started to cry. This slightly older boy, maybe 14 or so, walked up behind me. They say that the sandbox ate some kid, was all he muttered before walking away. 
I had chased that boy down and begged him for more information. He of course had nothing more than the rumors one would expect to come from the minds of children at a park in the middle of the city. A mix of bad urban legends mashed into some child-eating sandbox. That was the day Josh and I became friends. Every time we went back to the park, I sought him out and asked about the latest scary thing to happen at the park. Sometimes I think he had to think quickly to come up with something. The slide had sliced a kid in half. The merry-go-round would make you depressed. If you swung high enough on the swings, you could drop into an angel's hands and disappear forever. That sort of thing. As we got older, we'd make up new urban legends and tales to entertain ourselves with. Eventually, we stopped going to the bar. After we left town for college, we stopped hanging out. Then, out of the blue, the message was sitting in my voicemail. Dude, remember the old park? The one on Bethany Street? I think I found something new about the sandbox eating kids. Meet me there Friday night at 10. So there I was, walking into my old stomping grounds. The park looked the same as it ever did, with the exception that there was sand in the sandbox. When I got close enough, I could see something sticking out of the middle of the sand. Something black, like the sleeve of a jacket. When I reached for the sleeve, the world seemed to fall out from under me. That was how I ended up in this little room. Just as I came to this conclusion, I heard a noise like metal on stone. Light began to fill the room as I realized why I couldn't find a door. The entire wall was moving upwards. When my eyes adjusted to the light, I saw that the newly opened way out led to a brightly lit space with a similar opening in the far side. As I exited my little room, I saw Josh entering from the other side. We stopped as we made eye contact. Now, said a voice from somewhere above, now you fight to the death. It was like someone else had taken over my body. I rushed to Josh and took a wild swing at his head. He ducked and slammed his fist into my stomach. I doubled over and began to gasp for air. Just before his foot connected with the back of my head, I managed to roll out of the way. I was certain from the pain that he had broken one of my ribs. As I stumbled to my feet, he was rushing me, tears in his eyes. It was clear he didn't want to fight me either. Somehow, we were being forced to fight. To kill. While he ran, I prepared for the charge and I caught him in my arms. Falling backward, I slammed his head into the ground with a wet pop. When I stood, I had control of myself again. I was covered in blood, Josh's blood. I felt sick. Why would someone do this? How could someone do this? As the lights above dimmed, I saw that the stands in the arena where I killed my best friend were covered in bones. No doubt the previous combatants. What happens now? I screamed. Now you return to your realm. And with that, I was back in the park, in the sunlight, with some little kid staring straight into my blood-soaked face. Strangely, he didn't scream or jump or anything. In fact, he didn't even react. I waved my hand in front of his face a few times and he didn't seem to see me. I wasn't too perturbed that a kid was too absorbed in his games to see me pop out of thin air in front of him. My mom didn't live too far from the park, so I headed over to her place to clean myself up. As I walked through the front door, I yelled, Mom, are you home? And there was no reply. I assumed that she was working a day shift at the clinic. 
Nothing made her day better than getting someone to give her a day shift. Her nights at the clinic were the worst. Too many people bringing in their overdosed friends. Too few people who didn't need immediate medical attention. I walked through the house carefully so I didn't drip blood on her precious rugs. When I made it to the stairs, I paused. There was no way I was making it upstairs to the bathroom without dripping somewhere. I took my time and walked carefully up to the bathroom, taking a moment to stop by the linen closet to get out a fresh towel. Looking back down the stairwell, I marveled at the lack of blood. Counting myself lucky, I headed into the bathroom to shower. I turned on the hot water and left it for a few moments as I undressed. I began to rinse the blood out of my clothes. The water dripped red as it went down the drain. Once my clothes were fairly clean, I climbed in my cell. The scrubbing process for dried blood from a human being is quite rigorous. I learned this when I was younger. My mom would come home from the clinic, covered herself. She would spend hours in the shower trying to make sure she got it all off. Imagine then my surprise when no matter how long and hard I scrubbed, it wouldn't wash off. The water wasn't affecting the blood like it should have been. The blood had been about half caked when I entered my childhood home. Now with water running over it, it should have been mixing in and liquefying. The blood simply stayed as it had been before I got in the shower. I jumped out of the shower and ran to grab the towel, falling on my way there. Gasping for breath, I climbed to my feet and began drying off, blood first. Once again, I was horrified to see that the blood was not being dried nor removed by the towel. I stumbled into my old room and began to frantically rummage through the closet. I found some clothes I had left there, just before I went off to college. I jogged back down the stairs and to the bowl by the door where I'd left my phone. I called my mom to talk and got her voicemail. I left a quick message saying we needed to talk and that I'd be at the house when she got home. I laid an old sheet over a seat on the couch and watched TV. As I heard her key scrape into the lock, I heaved myself to my feet and walked over to meet her at the door. She came inside and placed her keys in the bowl. She took a bleary-eyed look around. Hey mom, I think I may have a broken rib and this blood won't come off. She didn't respond. She walked over to the couch and pulled the blanket I'd placed there off and began to fold it. Mom, I think this is serious. I think I need to go to the emergency room or the urgent care. Again, she didn't respond. Mom, she didn't even flinch. I went over and tried to spin her around and make her look at me. No matter what I did, she moved in just the right way to avoid my touch. It became maddening. Nothing I did allowed me to touch her. It wasn't like I was a ghost or something. And going through her, it was more that I was simply always in the wrong place at the wrong time. I have found after about a year in this state that I can't touch anyone. No one can see me. No one can hear me. The blood cannot be washed off. The blood doesn't dry. I'm telling you this because you're the only one who's seen me since it happened. I... I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I need help. But I don't know where to turn. Thank you for listening. I have been Orpheus. This has been the All Night Society. I now leave you with four uninterrupted hours of blissful music.
world.